introduce our keynote speaker. So Cassie Wallander is the Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder of Envio. And uh, please come and welcome uh, Cassie today. Thank you all. Thank you, Toby. I'm very excited to be here with you guys today. Um, is the mic working? Yeah. All right, great. So uh, let's jump right in. We're right on time, very impressed. <laughs> Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the design-driven startup. So as a quick uh, show of hands, um, how many of you are working at what you would consider a, a large company? How about mid-size? Okay, a lot of mid-size folks. How about small or even startup? Okay. We've got maybe one. <laughs> so for those of you who aren't in a startup, um, perhaps this will inspire you that it can be done, design at a startup level, uh, and maybe something to consider for your future career paths and your journey. Um, one more question. How many of you have worked at a startup before? OK, great. Fantastic. So we have quite a few people who have participated in the craziness that is startup life. So this should relate um, well with that. So my name is Cassie Wallander. I'm the chief product officer and a co-founder at a small Seattle-based startup called Invio. And we focus on making clinical trials safer and faster by automating the data quality monitoring process for clinical trials. Now I won't um, go too far into that. I'll kind of leave it mostly at that. Although if you have any involvement in clinical trials, I would love to talk to you about it later. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the design experience within a, the startup and some kind of guerrilla hacks you can use to make sure that design is a first-class citizen, even at a scrappy startup that doesn't have a lot of resources. In fact, I'm here to convince you, although I probably don't need to, that it's an essential component for step zero of your startup, uh, and that in the long run, it will be uh, behoove you to invest early and invest often, even at a time when you don't have a lot to invest uh, and you're stretched thin. So previous to starting Invio, I was at another life sciences startup. So we have a little bit of a life sciences theme. Um, I was at Aperture, which was acquired by IMS Health. And previous to that, I was at iLike, which was a, more of a consumer rather than B2B startup, uh, which ended up acquired by <coughs> MySpace. Um, <laughs> but we don't talk about that. Uh, so my theme today is UX as preventative care instead of a Band-Aid, going with the life sciences uh, scheme. So who am I to talk about this? Um, briefly, uh, I'm an expert in product management and user experience design mostly for life science SaaS companies, so more on the enterprise b B2B thing, but as mentioned, I did um, start out in consumer, which is where I got this crazy idea that you should earn all your views and people should be delighted and full of joy every time they use your product. Um, and I'll talk more about that later, but I wanted to bring it to enterprise where there's so much opportunity for uh, improvement. And I won't go through my credentials because that just seems like a waste of time. Um, but I will say I have been at three startups and I've observed two approaches. So on the left side, we're going to talk about a traditional startup scenario, uh, which is design as a Band-Aid. So what does that look like? Some phrases and uh, memes you may have heard. Uh, you start with a solution instead of a problem. This often looks like a tech person looking at another industry and seeing its brokenness and saying, oh, I'm going to swoop in and save the day. And also, you may have heard this a lot, you know, we're going to throw some spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, and then uh, you may have heard, we move fast and we break things. And then, well, there's some value to fail fast. Um, you definitely cannot do that in healthcare. Um, <laughs> And then finally, well, you know, OK, we have some users and some money now. Either someone invested in us or someone paid us. It's year three, it's year four, it's year seven. I think we should hire a design person. I don't know what that looks like, but they can help make things pretty. <laughs> Ugh. 
Have you ever been that design person? I have. <laughs> I see some hands. Yeah, so you're coming in and it's definitely a band-aid situation where you're like, oh my god, stop the bleeding. What's going on? Did you guys ever talk to users? Um, and then you end up in this place where people say, I know it's broken, but it's designed this way, usually by the development team, to uh, function under this certain way of the certain architecture or what have you. And refactoring would be so expensive and hard that we're just going to force our users to jump through some hoops and make it work. Uh, and if they're lucky, they've found some value, they've solved some problems, and so the users are willing to jump through those hoops, but they aren't happy. And if the users aren't happy, ain't nobody happy. So on the left side, we have unhappy customer, customers, frustrated teams, because they know their users are unhappy. Uh, they're constantly chasing down tech debt, tech debt and probably chasing down some UX debt along the way, if you're lucky. Uh, and everybody's frustrated because they're feeling like I'm building the wrong thing. I'm not focused on the thing I need to focus on. So the other approach is, of course, design-driven. Design is preventative care, a much, much different approach, starting with that first, should we even build this startup? It starts with a problem in search of a solution. So this is a big difference. I know it's just a little word reorganization, but it means you're starting with, this is a pain, a really bad pain. How can I find a way to fix it? Not, I've got a cool technology. How can I apply it to some area that needs help? If you start with the pain, that means you have a deeper, more intimate understanding of what it is you're trying to actually achieve. And it will keep you focused keep your eyes on the prize and keep your team organized around a central mission and then you will find the technology you need to to fix the problem but if you start with the problem that means you're really starting with the user this sounds a lot different in practice so you hear well I experienced this pain point and it was so hard for me to deal with I was so frustrated that I decided to quit my day job and go start this company uh, you hear, this is a pain relief pill, not a vitamin. So people aren't doing, using our product to uh, make things slightly nicer. They're doing it because they, they need it. And then people ask, when can I buy this in testing? This indicates people are like, wow, this is solving my problem. It also indicates there's testing. <laughs> so that's great. Um, and then you'll hear stuff like this. We started with user-centered design methodologies to validate our hypothesis and get functionality right before ever writing a line of code. End result, our customers love us. This is a totally different experience, right? Happy customers, happy team. It takes a lot more investment on the beginning of the company to get it right, or at least get 90% of the way there but it's ultimately a lot more efficient. You do not want to run a company down the wrong path for three years. So hopefully I've convinced you which of these approaches uh, should be taken. But if you're in this room, I suspect you may have already appreciated <laughs> the uh, approach on the right. So um, one thing that I've heard a lot coming out of Amazon, um, I'm not coming out of Amazon, but I've heard this coming out of Amazon, is this concept of working backwards. And I feel like it really sums it up, starting with the pain. Uh, and Jeff Bezos said, the working process, uh, working backwards is not designed to be easy. It's designed to save huge amounts of work on the back end and make sure we're building the right thing. So it is hard on the front end, but worth it. What so many companies do is they build software, then they throw it over the wall to the marketing department and say, here's what we built, write the press release for it. That process is the one that's actually backwards. And while I have some problems with some of the Amazon UI, <laughs> I really, really believe in this idea where at Amazon, they actually figure out who's the customer they're trying to build whatever thing they're building for and write the press release and the FAQ for that product or feature first and work totally backwards instead of later on marketing trying to fill, fill in the blanks. 
And I think this is a really uh, interesting application of starting from the customer pain point. So we're going to move into step one, understanding the customer. So <clears throat> if, you're start if you're founding a startup, uh, your job is not just UX. It's customer experience. And uh, some of us at this table were kind of actually talking about this just before at lunch. Uh, you really have to think about what's the experience starting with the first time they hear about your company. You know, what's that tagline that sums up what you do? And uh, that's where I bring in the Amazon process. Like, what's the PR little nugget that you want them to sum up? How, what's the problem you're addressing and who you're addressing it for? And then they see themselves in that and they see their problem in that. Um, <clears throat> so you, you just don't serve anyone if you end up building a product people love, but you're building it in a business you can't sustain. So this understanding of the customer ensures you have the financial wherewithal to build a business around the pain point you're trying to solve. If you solve the pain point, but the company goes under, you're not able to provide that solution to anyone and it doesn't do anybody any favors. So that you really have to understand this customer idea, not just a user idea. So what does that look like? Well, sometimes it looks like the buyer persona being totally different than the user persona. And that introduces its own set of crazy challenges. Um, I personally believe that this is why user experience is so awful in enterprise software. The person making the buying choices and writing the checks is often not the poor schmo who has to use the product every day. Uh, and that makes our jobs even harder because uh, we have to convince two different people with two different sets of motivations, wants, desires, concerns, why they should go with my startup for something. So to the buyer, you have to convince them of ROI to the user, you have to convince them it actually solves the problem they're trying to solve and is going to be a joyful delight to use. Um, and it, it really does mean as a startup founder or an early employee, you wear an extra big hat when it comes to user experience design in that you have to design for the buyer persona as well. So that might look like some kind of executive level dashboarding. It might look like some separate reporting. Um, there's a lot of different ways to attack that. What is the ROI scenario? But you do definitely have to attack it. So be cognizant of it. And make sure you have a narrative there. Um, another thing is the, uh, so you're pointing out ROI versus the user value. And that's assuming they're in the same company. Sometimes that buyer persona and the user persona aren't even at the same company. So if you're in an ecosystem like mine, where clinical <laughs> trials involve study sponsors, research sites running the studies, and a whole other category of business called contract research organizations that are running the studies for the sponsors in between. They all have their distinct sets of users, their distinct sets of buyer personas, and their distinct motivations. Us making a clinical trial more efficient because you don't have to visit the site to access data all the time, super great for the sponsor and the research site, but hurts the, the middleman's bottom line, so they don't like that. <laughs> and so those are the types of considerations and examples you have to keep in mind when you're actually building a business. Um, and all this is to say, uh, this understanding really comes from having a subject matter expert on your team as a, a leader or a founder who's, sol who's solving that pain point that they experience directly who is an example of the customer, not an outsider with a technology looking for application. Be your own ideal customer or have one right at hand uh, because there's so many factors involved in those ecosystems to understand. Going back to the Amazon example, um, AWS was built to solve Amazon's own internal problem. If they had tried to go out and solve the problem externally, they probably wouldn't have even known it was an opportunity. But because they built it with themselves as their own customers, they were then able to broaden. All right, so um, one of the things I love about this group is the great principles that really form this group. And one of them is 
to include XD in your company's DNA. Um, so I've talked at length about this already, so I won't go into too much, too many details. But really, including uh, a subject matter expert in the founding team or early leadership is a one way that you can really make this part of your company's DNA. Then also make sure you are including someone with experience and chops in user experience design. So. Um, can those people be the same person? Yes. Do they have to be? No. But uh, those are ingredients you need in an early team. You know, your early team is going to be small, so if you can combine them, uh, awesome. But it's also good to have them separate um, so you can kind of bounce ideas off each other. So when I say at least one, that's what I mean. Um, and then we also talk about personality types. You know, I really believe in diverse teams of age, gender, sexuality, race, national origin, et cetera. But personality type is another way you can be diverse in a team. And bringing on what I call a wizard and an, an executor is a really uh, fundamental part of forming your early stage company. Uh, the wizard is someone who says, what if we have this amazing, grandiose vision and we solve, cure cancer by doing this thing? Um, and the executor is the person who says, I'm a type A detail-oriented person. What's the project plan for that? Uh, and the, those people are probably not the same person, <laughs> but they could be also found in your SME or designer. So make sure you have uh, diverse uh, experiences and personalities on the team. And then uh, to the company values piece, uh, this is a really critical way how you can get uh, into your company's DNA and make sure design's really in there and a part of it. Uh, you have to start early and start often when it comes to company values. If it's something you start you know, a year into the company and you're like, gosh, some investors asked us what our values were, we better figure out what those are. <laughs> you know, that's too little too late. And they don't mean anything if you're not referencing them and applying them and revisiting them and revising them. Um, so make sure that your company values actually have something about being user-centered in them. Uh, and stay, um, stay user-centered within your team. You know, like constantly reevaluate those values. Uh, we, we make sure that our company handbook is a living document that gets upversioned every so often. And we think about our team the same way. When we hire more people, we're not looking for people who fit our company culture. We're looking for people who add to our company culture and bring more to it. We don't want a bunch of clones. That's no good. Um, and so everybody who comes to the team should be adding to the culture and bringing a, a care for the users with them. Um, so on the right here, it's, the contrast is such you may not be able to see it, but I put a screenshot of our company handbook. And you can see our values. One of them is be an investigator, validate hypothesis through experimentation, and collect the data. And that's a big part of how we like to be design driven because that's uh, really talking about don't just be like, eh, I think I should make it like this because that's my opinion. Like, go and find out and do the investigation and work. Uh, talk to users. And then we re emphasize that in our last value, which, which is connect with customers first. Uh, you know, don't just make those assumptions. And this isn't to say every squeaky wheel gets the grease. If a customer says, build me a yellow widget, we don't just build a yellow widget. We start asking questions. Why? What's the problem you're having? How is this yellow widget solving that problem? And we use methods like the five whys to get down to the root of what are they really asking for? Because they don't know what's even possible with technology. So it's not import as important for us to understand the solution they're asking for as it is for us to really understand the problem that they're experiencing. Um, and then lastly, I kind of touched on this already, during your hiring and promoting, uh, you know, instead of having culture fits, hire for culture ads. And um, <clears throat> one thing I want to emphasize is company values uh, are not really the ones that are written in the handbook. They're the behavior that the company rewards through promotions, and praise and also 
what people are watching and seeing that the company is willing to look the other way on. So if you have somebody who's you know, not listening to users, not collecting data, and they're getting a lot of kudos and acclaim at the company moving forward, that's not really much of a company value. You actually have to hold people to this as the ruler or take a look, long, hard look in the mirror and be like, is this really our value? Um, so uh, the first hire set the tone. And if there's disrespect for the users, uh, the user's pain, or the design process early, nip it in the bud. Get that out of your team. <laughs> All right, so all, moving on from values, um, let's talk about validating the opportunity. So we validated the customers. Uh, we've made sure to include this in our DNA. Now let's really look at the problem. Is it an opportunity? Uh, so at any startup, there's a special challenge here because you can't do user testing if you don't have any users. and you're presumably starting pre-customer acquisition. So this is, uh, how do you kind of hack around this problem? Especially if you're at a small resource limited startup, you can't just hire people to go figure it out for you, right? There's, and there's two um, aspects to really understanding what is your problem that I want to emphasize. Um, I'm presuming that it's a real problem, so skipping that. One, is the problem big enough to build a company around? And two, is it a pain you have a special insight to? Which is touching on that having an SME in the company aspect. You know, have you had this problem yourself? Do you understand why the problem exists? Do you understand the context and the history of the problem? Do you know the players? Do you understand the ecosystem? Do you know the legal and compliance frameworks that the problem lives inside of? Do you understand the challenges, the motivations that are out of alignment between the players, and how to get them back into alignment, which is a big, big challenge? How much behavior change is required to solve the problem? Are people incentivized to change? A lot of these are not tech questions. They're people questions. And if the opportunity is so great that you could build a company around it, why hasn't it already been fixed? Right? Those are questions you have to fundamentally understand before forming a, a company around it. Bonus validation is it venture scale. So if you're interested in raising money, this is a whole other ball of wax you have to deal with. Uh, for time's sake, I won't go into this, but uh, this is a question you should consider greatly. If that's your plan, don't just, don't just assume it will work out. It has to be a really big opportunity, and you have to be able to capture a significant portion of the market share to make an investor even remotely interested. So let's do a little group breakout activity. Um, at each table, I'd like you to take four or five minutes and just discuss amongst yourselves. Introduce yourselves if you haven't already, but let's try to make a brief uh, and talk about how you could really validate this uh, for your pretend startup, hypothetically. Uh, before you presume you have zero customers and say, uh, if I can solve this problem, can I build a great, good business? What are the tactics, like the actual things you could use? And we'll talk about some of them when we come back together. All right, you guys have it all figured out, I'm hoping, so I could learn from you. <laughs> We're going to take a minute and actually, where did the microphone go? I'd like to hear from maybe one representative from each table about some of the maybe top three tactics. Um, top three tactics you guys talked about to validation that you have a good business opportunity and you're really solving a customer experience problem. Um, who wants to start? Any brave volunteers? You're smiling. This, it wasn't my idea actually, but I'll try to articulate it. Um, uh, one of the ideas was to um, look to the this me. Um, hopefully you have have that SME on your team and um, get an understanding of what the customer pain points are. Um, another idea, what, and, and sort of extrapolate from that mm -hmm. to um, get a sense of what customers, potential customers, might be feeling and how you can solve their problems. Um, another idea was um, to create some surveys to send out to people that you thought might uh, match your 
customer profile mm -hmm. and uh, kind of understand, uh, just get some data to start with, to start building that. The idea there that the, the business that I'm building is all around home maintenance and taking care of the appliances and things and so uh, in your home. So understanding, you know, if there is a market there was relatively easy because so many of my peers have a home and, and finding, you know, that other people have the same problems mm -hmm. is a very good way. If you hear it's kind of the like your slide said, when somebody said, Oh, can I buy that? while you're testing, well even before you're testing, you're just talking about the idea and people are saying, I need that, or that happened to me, that's, that was a good trigger point for me to say there's, there's probably a business in this. And then you, for me, I think the other piece was you, you, you do the, the market sizing. So if this is a problem for me and this is a problem for five of my friends, how many people are there like me and my friends? There's 120 million homes, so that's a probably a big enough market to address. So. Great, awesome. Uh, bat around a bit was the the concept of if we could solve uh, like water water quality problems, whether that's through desalination, uh, contamination in a portable and transportable way, uh, whether it's because of disaster, geopolitical, or whatever, you know, if we had a device or you know some sort of facility that could be taken places around, could could you build something out of that, and how could you monetize that? Because things get to be interesting then. It's like, well, you know, it's humanitarian. How do you charge for water? Who pays for it? How do you do these things? Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we didn't really come up with a way really to crack it. <laughs> but we know it's a, bit, it's a problem you that needs to be cracked. build a whole company in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, but, uh, you know, the experience of doing that, of, of how you position that in front of, you know, NGOs or governments or, you know, things like that would be an interesting way to figure out how that could then, especially in, or torn areas and stuff like how do you how do you fix that and make it something people want to invest in and is, is a sustainable going concern so yeah and that brings up a really good point about you know I kind of have been hammering you're not just solving a problem you're building a business that can sustain the solving of the problem um, but there are some weird exceptions some lovely exceptions to that rule where you know you there's grant opportunities there's organizations there you know, money is not going to solve all of the problems and there's not always a good business correlated to a v solving a very good problem. Um, but if you are looking to build a business as this sustainable route, these are some things you need to do. Um, but yeah, it doesn't encapsulate the whole enchilada for sure. So I had written down some ideas on validating a startup, but this was really just some short list there's many many ways you guys touched on some of them as well you know I did a lot of the validation with SM SMEs that you were talking about um, and uh, did a lot of going out and finding people who weren't my customer but matched the user profile of my customer the persona and worked with them and then also that learned I need to also find the buyer persona and work with them to find out what's important to them um, so making sure to target both groups and really figure it out. Uh, so some other fun techniques I use that were kind of a little more guerrilla is uh, I found Facebook groups dedicated to the people who worked in the jobs that were experiencing the problem I was trying to solve and just listened and observed what were their problems, what were their pain points, what was driving them bonkers, uh, did the things they were saying validate. You know, you can tap into those groups to also see if they'd be interested in taking surveys and stuff like that. I would encourage you to go outside your personal circle because we all know our friends and our mom are going to say, it's beautiful, sweetie, I love it. I'll, I'd pay a million dollars, you know, and that doesn't count. People, even people you don't know will always tell you what they think you want to hear. So you have to very carefully structure surveys and questionnaires to be as unbiased and unleading as possible so that you don't um, psych yourself out thinking you're onto something when you're not and going down a path that's going to take you back to building the wrong thing. Uh, so try to be as humble and honest through this process as possible, honest with yourself overall. Um, one of the most validating things is if you can get to a place where you may not have no product or no feature, but people are willing to buy it 
and they're actually signing up to buy it. So you might even have a workflow on a splash page that says sign up now and they give you your info and there's a button that says enter your credit card info. Now I wouldn't collect their credit card info if you don't have a real company or anything, but understanding I have an email address and a name and a person who clicked a button that said here's my credit, I'm gonna give you my credit card information and then you get them to a place where they say oh sorry it's going to a waiting list we're not quite ready yet to send it to you that that information is like hard data about people are willing to pay for this and even a small sample of those is better than a bunch of kind of loosey-goosey yeah sure I would buy that in a survey to people you don't know who they are and you don't if you followed up with them only one percent might convert kind of thing and if you take that kind of hard data to an investor, you're gonna get a lot better response. So try to get as close to the real deal as possible. In B2B scenarios, that might look like an LOI where you've talked to the buyer persona at a company who's gonna be your client and said, if I build this, will you buy it? And will you put it in a, a non-contractual letter that says, if you build this, I would like to buy it. Um, that is something you can take to investors too, or to people you're trying to convince to join you on this startup journey. You know, if you have the LOIs in hand, the letters of intent, uh, that's a strong data point as well. And lastly, record everything, um, because this data is going to help keep you sane, it's gonna help you find great team members, it's going to help you find investment, it's gonna keep you focused. Next, once you've validated your company, it's time to validate the solution. And I think a lot of you are well versed in this, so I will not spend too much time on it. But for us, that really looked like building a prototype, not code, but just a click through prototype of our basic solution, our hypothesis of what the MVP would look like. And then uh, just getting it in front of people who match those personas and listening, 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 listening staying extremely humble and walking into every conversation assuming this is not our product, this is our hypothesis, it is wrong, we don't yet know where it's wrong, but we're here to learn. Put on your humble hat every day you go into design conversations and you'll learn so much more. Um, so this for me meant being really scrappy, bringing study coordinators at research clinics Starbucks and ex exchanging that for their time and clicking through things. Trying very hard to keep my mouth shut and my ears open and just watching them use the product and having them speak through their actions and say, I'm clicking this because I'm trying to achieve X and now I'm gonna go here because I'm trying to achieve Y. So that instead of me telling them, try to achieve X or what would you click on for Y or even telling them click on that thing to do this, I was able to learn so much more by taking a back seat and observing and listening. Um, so let's see. I'm actually in the light of time. I have five minutes left, so I'm gonna skip the second breakout session um, and talk about those validation techniques for your product. Um, so similar to um, validating the company, but you really have to dig in and get specific with your prototype. Uh, test workflows, we already actually talked about this with the people who match your personas. And then, um, this is something I wanted to mention, define, not build, your earliest testable product, which is what what's not gonna be your MVP, but it's there enough that you can start to learn by putting it out in the field. Earliest usable product, and earliest lovable product. And your MVP is probably in the middle there. Um, again, use smoke and mirrors. <laughs> do not build the whole product, spending a year to do so, and then go to people with it. Uh, and in, if you're not iterating anymore, if people are like, I love it, great, where can I buy it? Um, they should either be trying to buy it or convince their boss to buy it for them. Uh, and, and if they're not at that stage, you should be iterating more. So you probably have seen this. I love this illustration. I can't take credit for it. Um, it's from a guy named Henrik Nyberg. Uh, but basically, you want to build something, obviously, that solves a small problem and then uh, solves more problem and more problem. 
in, in pursuit of constantly making their daily lives easier rather than trying to do a waterfall methodology where you're building an entire office suite or something and then handing it to them. You know, you don't have to solve every problem, you just have to solve a problem that's driving enough value for them to want to use your product and pay for it. So fast forward, you have some users, what do you do? Oh my gosh, we have five users. Talk to them, talk to them all the time. Empower your team to talk to them. Have your devs meet with them. Have your devs shadow you on conversations with the users and go along on those ride-alongs. The devs should not feel like they're not allowed to talk to users. Um, if you don't trust your devs to talk to users, you've hired the wrong devs. They don't have to be like the most charming people people in the world, but they should, you should trust them to represent your company in front of anyone. Uh, never ever stop listening to your users. So here's a joke reference from to back to 1967. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? I like to think of it this way. Do you know where your users are? Do you know what they're doing? Do they know you know how they're using your product? Are you paying attention to the analytics, the quantitative and qualitative data? Now that you have some users, everything they're doing in your product and outside of your product and talking about your product is a gold mine that you should be digging through constantly. Um, I'm gonna fast forward a bit, but this is a favorite nerdy quote from Dune about fear, and I've fixed it for them. <laughs> so now it says, uh, where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only a delightful product for my users will remain. <laughs> because I think this is the number one reason people don't talk to their users, is they're so scared that they're gonna hear from their users, you know, I don't love this one thing. And we just need to, swallow our egos and toughen up and talk to our users because it's the only way we're gonna get to a place where they're, they're surprised and delighted is by fearlessly and humbly approaching them and if you're at a startup in the scrappiest way possible. So there's a lot of different ways you can achieve this. I am happy to send these out. You're probably familiar with most of them but one thing I wanna emphasize is don't just focus on the stuff that the design team, or if you're the only person in the design team is doing, focus on what are the, uh, what are the analytics coming back from the support team? What are the categories people are reaching out about? What are the questions the sales team is getting? What are these other pieces of information that are channels coming in to the company, giving you data about the customer? And if you're not recording it, you can't improve it. So make sure you're tracking it all and paying attention to those trends over time. And down in the very, very, very bottom, you know, I also say including churn exit interviews. Be brave enough to talk to people when they walk away and say, I'm not gonna try to convince you to change, but I'd really like to understand why. Could I take 20 minutes of your time and buy you a coffee or talk to you on the phone? And, I just really like to learn. And if you approach it like that, most people will give you the time. <coughs> so lastly, I wanna finish on a quick case study uh, for uh, our Cedar sinai Medical Center pilot. We collected information on support tickets during that time, and I don't know if you can tell due to the contrast here, but across the different departments, we categorized every support ticket into different categories, and by the end of the pilot, we were able to realize a pattern that 50% of our support tickets were coming from uh, record management questions and how do I add additional, can support add an additional user to my instance for my clinical trial? So by the end of the pilot, we were able to add a user management tool that empowered the users to do that themselves, to invite people to their clinical trial and to control their permissions for what they could see. You know, could they see redacted information or not? Could they see all the sites in the study or not? That sort of thing. And the, it empowered them to do it themselves. And it meant that 25% of our support tickets were immediately gone. So I was able to reroute that dev time doing boring tier one support stuff into let's develop this feature and all those that whole category of tickets just goes away and the users are a lot happier when they can get it done immediately even if our support team was sure i'll do it for you right away in five minutes it was still a piece of gridlock they had to go through to get something done so support is like a gold mine for what can i build that will both reinvest itself back into the team and make people users a lot happier 
And then the record management piece we also built out, and I won't go into the details of that, but that knocked out the other 25%. Um, so in summary, starting with design will lead to a happier, more successful you, and your team will be happier and more successful, and your users will be happier and successful. So just definitely do it. <laughs> Um, having the right team from the get-go with subject matter expertise and design chops and the right personalities are an absolute must. You're only going to have a small team, make sure it's the right people in your startup. And this can also scale up to if you're just getting started with design in a bigger company. Be scrappy, honest, and fearless in your approach to validating both your understanding of your customers uh, and that a business can be built around the problem you focus on and that your solution will actually meet the needs of those customers. And fake it until you make it. <laughs> and lastly, and if I could say one thing all day, it would be this, never stop listening. Thank you very much for your time. I'm three minutes over, but <laughs> I think we still have time for a couple Q&A items. Yeah, we do. Um, does anyone have any questions for um, you, you mentioned prototyping and stuff to try yes. to get early out before you build stuff. Are there tools that you prefer or you found have been successful or do you just do pen and paper or what's kind of been your approach to that stuff? That's a great question. Um, so I'm sort of agnostic. The most important thing is that you do it. Um, me personally, I used Sketch to uh, to mock up our screens, and then uh, and I liked Sketch a lot because it's very fast. It's easy to um, iterate on very quickly, and um, and with the way we used it, which was in conjunction with Envision, you're able to push out prototypes really, really quickly and slickly. They even have the ability to like click somewhere and add a comment to certain things. Uh, one of the reasons since I love computers is because I have a really bad memory. So writing everything down when the user says, oh, this button wording was confusing or something, I have to write it down and check it off later. Um, or I might not remember to write it up. So um, that was my preferred kind of toolkit is sketch in a combination with Envision and Craft. Um, those, those were super essential in getting us going quickly. Um, that being said, there's a lot of tools, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Oh, one thing I would say to that is anything that allows the customer to take the reins on driving and actually doing the click through, that's a key aspect. If they don't have at least that level of smoke and mirrors, you have to tell them, and then this would happen. And that breaks the illusion. <laughs> So this is related to the smoke and mirrors. Um, so I, I do really appreciate your process of sort of doing those rapid prototypes and testing and getting that feedback so you can iterate really quickly. But at what point do you say, okay, well now we're ready for some architects, some engineers to start laying the groundwork? Yeah. You know, like when, when do you sort of like ramp that on? Great question. Um, so I, I think some of this is a bit of experience and intuition. Um, so it's going to be different in every scenario. But usually, you want to involve your development team as early as possible. Um, once you have the fundamentals of you know, kind of the data structures you'll be building and how they relate to each other, uh, they can start uh, a lot of the back end pieces. Um, and as long as you have the, the sort of fundamentals in place, you can start going to them with that. Also, you have to involve, uh, from a front end perspective, you want to involve design as early as possible so that you understand the trade offs. Um, and this kind of varies depending on how technical your design team is. But you want to make sure that whether it's inherent knowledge you have or it's communication with the developer team, uh, you understand the trade-offs between building out the front end this way versus that way as far as speed to user goes because um, perfect is the enemy of the good, right? If you wait until, uh, actually one of my favorite phrases is if you ship your product and you're not a little bit embarrassed, you've waited too late to ship it, right? <laughs> so 
you have to be willing to let your baby bird fly before it's fully ready to get out of the nest. In healthcare, it's a little trickier because there's some things you cannot get wrong. You can never like sacrifice patient privacy or compliance or things like that. It's like I've mentioned a lot less of failing fast and um, move fast, break things mentality than at more traditional startups. Um, so we're even more so on the conservative side than most. But I would say try to be as non-conservative as possible and loop them in as early as possible. Um, make sure to over-communicate what is still tentative and in discovery. Yeah, great question. I had a question about validating um, your product and basically a solution that you're offering. Mm -hmm. So say you actually have a solution and then your user testing it and you're identifying multiple pain points. How do you sort of categorize which is the biggest pain point to go after first? And I'm, I'm asking this also from like a totally personal need is I, I have a product, there's multiple pain points. How, yeah. What do I do next? Because obviously it's like, okay, what do we next do next to yeah. solve that problem further? Like you built out that, yeah. like, oh, let's have a bicycle and then let's get to a exactly. car. So how do you prioritize within what you hear from surveys or people or spying or whatever? Yeah. Like, what do you do next? So I think there's a couple factors there. One great question, probably the most important question in product management, and the line between design and product management is, in my opinion, very, very fuzzy and should be. Um, for me personally, the tool I've used is um, recording what I'm hearing from users and understanding the frequency at which I get asked for uh, some sort of new feature and understanding uh, for them, how they would categorize the pain points uh, is very useful. When it comes to, there's kind of uh, two different categories here. There's issues with the existing product that you want to triage into prioritization. I rate those, uh, I weight them based on two axes, if you will. Um, one is if, if somebody runs into this problem, whether it's a lack of a functionality or whether it's, you know, the alignment is off in these pixels, you know, um, if somebody runs into this, how bad is it? And there's a severity ranking there. Uh, and if it's like, oh, there's a typo, it's, it's a little egg on her face, it's embarrassing, but it's, it's meh, you know, um, versus, well, this, this functionality that's supposed to work in the product is broken and not working, or it it's, appears to be broken, but it's not really broken, or there's a workaround. You know, there's varying levels of the severity, and that's the y-axis. And then on the, on the x-axis, I have likelihood that somebody is gonna run into this. So it could be 100% of the time, 100% of the users are gonna log into this because it's a problem with the login screen, versus only administrators who go to this one configuration page that's like three levels deep are going to see this and people hardly ever set up this configuration piece except for at the beginning of the study. So then I plot it on that uh, frequency versus severity, like if it happens how bad is it, how often is it going to happen, and that gives me uh, a weight to prioritize against everything else. And the reason I made this triage matrix is because I wanted my team to know everything was triaged based on reason and not just because Cassie felt this way today. And I wanted them to also be able to push back on me and say, do you really think that's a seven? I feel like it's a six because there's actually this workaround for it or something. Um, and it gave them a framework to have that discussion and make it less about uh, just how I felt and more of there's a logic behind it. So I would recommend not necessarily copying my system, but having a system in place to be a framework for that conversation. Yeah. All right, well, please help me um, and join me in thanking Cassie so much for today's presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun.